Our freedom of conscience and religion is being challenged by laws and regulations imposed by secular society. It's time to hear from the top Christian litigators in the nation who have come forward to tell us the truth and help us defend our faith. Hear ye, hear ye. All rise. Faith on Trial with Defender of the Faith, Deacon Mike Menno is in session. And welcome to Faith on Trial. We examine the influence of law and society on people of faith. I'm Deacon Mike Mano, your host. I'm flying solo today. Gina is gone. She is with her daughter at a college orientation session, which I suppose uh, is uh, her duty and uh, more important for her to be there than to be sitting in here with me. But we still have a show that we have to put on, and we still have some interesting guests coming in. We're going to first talk with uh, English, an English professor from Georgia State, Rob Jenkins, on an article he wrote about how the Biden administration is uh, conducting a war on religious freedom on college campuses. Uh, He wrote it uh, for an organization uh, called the um, James G. Martin Center for Academic Renewal, if you want to look up the the essay that he wrote. And uh, we're going to talk to him about uh, academic or about the religious freedom Uh, and that on college campuses and other places, too. And then uh, our second interview today is with attorney Charles LaMandry, who we've had on many times before. He's talked usually about um, uh, religious liberty and uh, and free speech protections and things like that. Today he's going to talk to us about a tort claim that he is working on. Uh, It's basically a medical malpractice lawsuit But it's an interesting set of facts. It involves a 12-year-old girl who was uh, uh, given a sex change operation. She turned out to be a a young lady that was very disturbed, had several mental uh, problems. Uh, But the doctors went ahead and uh, and started uh, started her on puberty blockers and ultimately uh, performed a mastectomy on her when she was 13. Uh, So we're going to talk to Charles and uh, and see what that is all about and how that may affect other things that are going on across the country, especially when we talk about the transgender uh, issues that uh, that are facing us today. Now, today is Thursday, and as many of you know, we uh, tape our program on Thursday mornings, and this Thursday morning, the Supreme Court is handing down certain decisions. Uh, We've got one that's already come down, and uh, uh, what it is, it's the uh, Harvard and uh, University of North Carolina case on affirmative action, whether race can be used as a sole factor in college admissions, and it appears, according to the Supreme Court, it cannot be. Uh, there'll be more coming out about that. You get a better breakdown uh, probably in your evening news or or later. But I remember several years ago, I wrote a, uh, as this case became uh, uh, percolating up in the system, I, I wrote a column in the uh, Wanderer about that. And, uh, and it has some very unique uh, issues involved and some facts. So if you get a chance, you might want to uh, check that out. There's several cases yet that are to be handed down this term. Uh, the rest of my guess will come tomorrow. Um, you might ask, why are we studying law and perhaps politics? Because we get into that a little bit here uh, on a religious broadcasting station. Well, it's very simple. It's because uh, over the last few years, there have been enormous attacks on our religious liberty. And we can see how that religious liberty has been curbed in so many places uh, where if you uh, object to that, you get canceled. You can lose your job. uh, You can be expelled from school. You can lose your social status. And the anti-bullying laws in school, the rules that they have in school, don't protect conservatives and Christians on that. Uh, so, and you might remember, uh, wasn't too long ago when churches were being closed in some areas, but strip clubs were allowed to be open. So these are the things that we take up here. And this is something that we ought to look at again, especially knowing that next week is the 4th of July. We're going to celebrate the independence of our nation. We're going to celebrate the handiwork of our founding fathers and we're going to look back and try and see what they were looking at, what their aspirations were for this country. And the aspirations, of course, were all men are created equal. And uh, we would have a, a, a nation 
that is independent and free. Uh, we seem to be falling down on that a little bit. So I uh, want to talk about that maybe a little bit later before we sign off. But to keep that in mind as we go into this July 4th uh, week, that we're looking at those things that made us what we are, and we want to preserve those, and we hope you will join with us in that preservation. Several years ago, Gina picked out a prayer to start us off with every week, and we've used that prayer ever since. And since Gina is not here, I can put on my other glasses. I will read the prayer to you to begin today's program. God of peace, bring your peace to our violent world. Peace to the hearts of all men and women, and peace among the nations of the earth. Turn to your way of love those whose hearts and minds are consumed with hatred. Strengthen us in hope and give us the wisdom and the courage to work tirelessly for a world where true peace and love reign in the hearts and minds of nations, in the hearts of all men. Amen. That is a prayer written by Pope Benedict XVI. And with that, we're going to take a few minutes off. And when we come back, we're going to have English professor Rob Jenkins with us. You're listening to Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio. And I'm back. You're listening to Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio. And with me is Professor Rob Jenkins from Georgia State University. He's an English professor there. And he's written an interesting uh, article that uh, appeared in... uh, uh, the, uh, let's see, James G. Martin Center for Academic Renewal on their webpage, if you want to find it. It's called uh, uh, Biden versus Religious Freedom on Campus. Interesting title, Rob. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about it and, uh, and what your argument is here? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. And uh, first, let me say that, uh, that my opinions are not necessarily those of my employer. In fact, they're almost certainly not. So I, <laughs> I'm not speaking for them. I'm just I'm speaking for myself. Uh, but Noted. This is something. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is something I've been keeping a close eye on for for several years. Um, religious freedom is uh, a, a passion of mine. I I personally believe that it is our most important freedom. I, I know we we argue and people say. Uh, you know, free speech is most important. But to me, the whole freedom of religion issue comes down to to what we believe, which is to say what we think. And so, you know, you, you can be free to say what you think, but if you're not free to think what you want, then you're really not free, and free speech is kind of moot at that point. So that that's why I believe that religious freedom is so vital to to our republic and to our overall freedoms as a people. And we, um, we agree with you here. We uh, I also hold uh, freedom of speech up very highly, too, because you can't evangelize without freedom of exactly. speech. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if you're not allowed to believe what you want, then then everything else is pretty much moved. That's moot. true. That's true. So, uh, thought, and, thought and, control. And not just not just believe it, but practice it in public life, which is where speech or expression comes in. Right. Um, because I, I think that is wrapped up in religious freedom, too. What the left wants to tell us is, oh, you know, you can be as religious as you want in your home or maybe even at church, but out in the public square, you're not allowed to do X, X Y, and Z. And what we're saying is, no, Freedom of religion means that I am free to to practice my religion, to hold to the tenets of my religion, to live my life according to those tenets, and and anything else is not freedom of religion. So, um, like I said, I've been keeping a close eye on this for for quite some time, and um, for the most part, I think the left in this country has 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 been kind of kind of clever. They haven't really taken the issue on directly. I mean, sometimes they will more so than others, but for the most part, they just kind of picked away at the edges. And, you know, as I said in my article, their strategy is, is not to, um, you know, deal one final felling blow to religious freedom, but to administer death by a thousand cuts. 
Yeah, that was an in, I, yeah, that was a very interesting observation that you made. And, and as I'm sitting back reading this, uh, or in my case, having it read to me, since after my stroke, I have difficult time reading. Um, th- that's what I'm thinking about. I, I've never really put it together like this, although every week on the program, we have somebody else coming in talking to us about some of these uh, infractions against religious liberty, some of which don't seem that that serious. But they all right. add up, and that's your death by a thousand cuts. Yes, you know, a perfect example of this is one that I mentioned in the article, and that is the Biden administration getting rid of the Trump era rule that protected religious organizations on public campuses. Uh, and that didn't get a lot of attention because, well, it, it doesn't affect religious institutions, it, ref- it affects religious clubs, for example, on state campuses. Mm -hmm. But it's just another one of of their tactics to to deprive us of our religious liberty every single place that they can. Um, And, you know, if if they if they can't force religious institutions to stop teaching religion, which they're not convinced that they can't long term, but if they can't do it short term, then at least they can get it off of the off of the public campuses. And of course, their their argument is, well, but those activities are already protected by the First Amendment. Well, yes, they should be, but in point of fact, they're not. The reason that rule was needed is is that colleges and universities, public colleges and universities, taxpayer-funded institutions, were in fact discriminating against religious organizations. And so, as I said, this this is one of their tactics. And it's one that doesn't get a lot of press because like you said, it seems to it, it's not it's it's not that big a deal. It doesn't seem to be that big of a deal, but it is a big deal, um, and especially when you put it together with everything else that they're doing. Yeah, and uh, and that's what I think when we put together our program. Sometimes that people might think, well, that's just a minor little case uh, over in upstate New York or something. What what the deal right. does that have with us? Well, it has a lot with us because, like you say, you know, you keep weakening the structure, and eventually it's going to fall. All right, who's behind all of this? Well, I, I think the global left mm-hmm. is behind it. Um, you know, one of the things that you almost always see in far left countries, and let's just be honest, communist countries, is that they do away with organized religion. And yeah. there's there's a very good reason for that, and that is that organized religion is the the natural enemy of leftist ideology. The, the two things are incompatible um, because leftist ide- ideology elevates the state over the individual and uh, religious belief preaches the, the uh, um, how important uh, individuals are to God, for example. Um, and, you know, they, they, can't, they can't have you thinking that, and they also can't have you thinking that there's something out there that is more powerful than the state. I, I, I think that that's really the crux of it. To the left, the state is the highest authority there is, to which we all owe our allegiance. And those of us who are Christians, for example, and, and probably many of our uh, Jewish and Muslim friends would say the same thing, our highest allegiance is to God, not to the state. And, and they simply cannot tolerate that. Because one of the things that means is that if the state tells us to do something that's not compatible with our belief in God, with with what we interpret scriptures to mean, with what we think God is asking us to do and how he's asking us to live, then then we're not going to do it. Right. And and so their, you know, their um, programs fall flat because people won't do it. I am the king's I, loyal servant. But God's first. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I think they figured this out years ago, which is why they're taking a more subtle approach now. They're not just trying to, you know, throw throw religion out of the public square all at once. They're just picking a little bit here. Well, well, no, you can't do that, and you can't do this. And of course, their greatest tool is um, this idea of discrimination. Well, you are free to have your religious beliefs, but if your religious beliefs discriminate against, you know, gay people or trans people or whatever category they they want to put in there, then um, 
then no, you can't practice those religious beliefs because you're discriminating and you're violating their rights. And so it, it gets and their rights in, uh, trump our religious uh, exercise. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, I would say two things about that. I would say, first of all, and, you know, when I when I hear people clamoring about trans rights, um, the first question I want to ask is what what rights do they not have that everybody else has? And and the answer is there are none. They They have the same rights as everybody else. Now, if people are discriminated against them in housing or jobs or whatever, that's wrong and they need to stop. But they have the same rights as everybody else. There, there's, there's no special set of rights. So, so no, our beliefs are not infringing on their rights because they're not losing any rights. They have, they have the same rights that we have. Um, but, but secondly, even if it does get down to a battle of rights, then, then I think we have to go back and consult the Constitution and see which rights have primacy, right? And I think that's very clear in the Constitution. Um, religious freedom is the very first right mentioned in the Constitution. So it seems to me that even if there is a clash between that and other rights, I'm, and I'm, I'm not convinced that there is, but even if there is, that, uh, that you know, freedom of re- religion ultimately has to win out because— it is the one that is it's not only spelled out explicitly in the constitution but it's the very first one right you uh, you mentioned in the article and, and I thought this was an interesting uh, take on things uh the example of the uh, respect for marriage act uh you want to explain to the listeners what that all involved yes um well, it's it's interesting, and I mentioned this in the article. Their their defense to um, getting rid of the the Trump era rule protecting religious organization on campus was well that rule wasn't needed because those those rights were already protected. Like as I said, I'm not sure that's true, but that that was their reasoning. Well, you could turn around and apply that exact same reasoning to this um, so called Respect for Marriage Act, which I call the Redefining Marriage Act. Um, you know that question was settled. For good or for ill, whether you whether you like the way it was settled or not, I personally don't. But regardless, that matter was settled by the Supreme Court in the Obergefell decision, and you know, same-sex marriage was at that point essentially the law of the land. Um, so, by their own reasoning, we didn't we didn't need a law to protect same-sex marriage. There was no need for it. It was already legal everywhere. Uh, so then you have to ask yourself, okay, since they didn't really need it for that purpose, what was the purpose of it? And um, several people, most notably uh, Senator Mike Lee from Utah, have pointed out that the purpose of it was basically to make religious institutions easier to sue. Uh, and, you know, re- those institutions may win those suits. But they they could potentially spend years and millions of dollars litigating those suits, which you know which which is unsustainable. Yeah, and then the it, propaganda value against them. Um, yes, it, it, the, exactly. Yeah, yeah, to diminish them, it, the, much the same as they're doing to the Supreme Court these days. If you notice what they're yeah, doing with the individual yeah. justices, they're using a propaganda right. war against them. Right. So, and, and that's really what I meant by by talking about a death by a thousand cuts. So, um, so some religious institution doesn't abide by the Respect for Marriage Act. They say if you're going to attend our institution, you know, you you can't have a same sex partner, or you know, whatever they might say that's in disagreement with that law. Um, and so, someone sues them for it, and this has happened. Maybe they win that suit, but how much money did it cost them? How much time did it cost them? Um, how long can that go on? And and how long will the courts continue to uphold the First Amendment in that case? Right. Um, so I, I, I really think that, that that was their plan 
was to make religious institutions, specifically colleges and universities, but eventually even maybe churches, easier to sue with the idea that over the long haul, they they wouldn't be able to sustain that effort. And I, and I do think, by the way, that they're coming for our churches. Um, I, I think... Um, I think they are, too. When the Obergefeller case came down, I was director of deacons here, and one of my jobs in my parish was I was the marriage minister. In other words, people wanted to get yep. married in the church. They would come. They would visit with me. And I noticed um, uh, prior to the decision that a number of people were kind of uh, appearing uh, through surrogates. In other words, they were college students or they were in another city, and they were sending us stuff that they were getting from the local nun who was handling some of this stuff up there, whatever. And, and so we'd set up the, the, um, uh, the, the wedding and the time and everything. And when Obergefeller came down, it dawned on me that this would be a great way for somebody to sue the church. Not that you can force them to perform the same-sex wedding ceremony or that you can sue them for not performing that, but you can create a contractual obligation that we now have a church reserve. We've got all of our invitations printed. And now when the bride and groom show up as two guys or two women, now you can't tell us you can't do that. And so you've breached uh. the contract that we have with you. And now it's a civil offense, not a religious matter. And uh, I remember warning several of my colleagues about that, that you might want to watch for this because it's liable to happen. Yeah, I, I, I hadn't thought about that. Um, You've never but, been a marriage minister then, put up no, with Mothers I, of the Bride. <laughs> I, I have done some lay counseling, but I've never, I've never done what, what you did there. <laughs> um, um, one of the things that I've noticed, too, is when we talk about the, what is going on in the progressive left worldwide— is that there's a, a deliberate attack on families these days. Yes, ab- absolutely. Um, be- because, uh, you know, family is the fundamental unit of society. And if you're going to control society, you have to control the families, you have to control the children. Um, a- again, they, they can't allow parents to be in control of their own children because parents might teach their children the wrong things. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I worked very hard for almost 30 years to teach all four of my children the wrong things as far as they're concerned. Mm-hmm. Um, and they just they, they can't have that. Um, again, those of us who are who are conservative and for the most part, whether religious or not, most conservatives, I think, would put family ahead of state. Right. In terms of, you know, where we where our allegiance lies. Um, and and we try to raise children who put family ahead of state, and then they go off to these colleges and universities and you know get indoctrinated into statism basically, and they come back home at Thanksgiving spouting all of this garbage and accusing their parents of being white supremacists and 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 the, the parents are just flummoxed by it. Where in the world did this come from? But that's all very much by design. They yeah. they have they have got to take the 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 um, raising of the children, the um, socialization, if you will, of the children away from the families as much as possible. Yeah, that's where the game is. It's the long term yes. that they're they're playing to get the hearts and minds of the children. And what you tell the story you tell about people coming home for uh, Thanksgiving and uh, and uh, spouting a new story that the parents have never heard before. I've heard that. I've heard people in my own parish tell me. You know my. My daughter yeah. and my son was a good Catholic boy. They went off to this college. Uh, they came home for Thanksgiving, and uh, we are white supremacists now. And uh, oh, yeah. you know, we're haters and too. all that. Yeah. And, of course, one of the things that they do is they try and pack us off into different tribes and then set the yeah. tribes against one another. I want to ask you, while we still have some time left here, about uh, a, since you, uh, you teach English, right? Yes, I, that's right. I hardly use the language myself, but <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, uh, Zach DePirio, I think is his name, a professor from one of the Penn State campuses, was an English professor, and uh, he was fired recently because he would not agree 
that uh, the English language is racist. Comments? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure I, you thought I, about I, that. I, I, I saw that story. I actually wrote an essay for the Chronicle of Higher Education about five or six years ago, um, arguing why we need to be teaching standard English in our classes, because it's absolutely vital if our, if our students are going to be successful in life, they have to be able to use the language and use it well. And of course, there's nothing inherently more racist about English than, than any other language. There are racist words um, in, in our language and you know, we teach our children not, not to use those words, but there's nothing inherently racist about the language. That's, that's utterly ridiculous. And the bottom line is that if you can't use the language well, um, you're going to struggle to succeed in society. And maybe that's part of, uh, maybe that's part of the strategy. They want to create um, people who are totally dependent on the government and not independent. Yeah. Uh, but but I, I will tell you, I have, I have had lots of non-native speakers, lots of immigrants in my classes over the years. I mean, lots. And um, I, I can tell you those young people are absolutely hungry, not just to learn English, but to learn to be able to use English well, because they, they recognize rightly that it is their entree into, you know, high-paying professional jobs. Right. Um, and this is, this is what I try to teach my students, and I, I will continue teaching them that. I'm, I'm fortunate to be in Georgia, which is, you know, still a, a, a red state. And, uh, of course, you know, most of our institutions are blue, you know, lean, lean yeah. left. But <laughs> the people who run things are more center to right of center. So I haven't had to deal with that yet. I don't I don't know if I will, but um, I, I can promise you that I won't back down from teaching the things that I'm that I'm teaching. You know, I, well, I, when they tar I and feather it. you on campus and <laughs> and carry you away well, and try and cancel you, you, you we'll, know, we'll have then, you back. <laughs> then, 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 yeah, I appreciate it. You know, so, it, you know, if I, I'm not trying to start trouble, but if you want to come after me, come after me. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I'm not I'm not going to stop doing what I'm doing. I, I read yesterday you about speak a biology professor. the truth. Professor. What you do is you speak the truth, and you should be okay. That's that's I I. I do my darndest to tell students the truth right. and the things that I think will help them most in life. And I might occasionally be wrong about things, but but as as best I can, that's what I try to do. Right. We're running, starting uh, to run out of time. You had a story about a biology professor. Yeah, a biology professor who was fired for saying that uh, that biological sex is is determined by chromosomes. So, yeah. you know, we we have English professors who who can't teach proper English, and we have biology professors who can't teach biology. I mean, what's going to be next? Medical professors who can't actually teach medicine, who aren't allowed to because it's racist? Um, that's, that's coming. If that's coming. Don't sure, this. sure, that's coming. And we're sitting back, twiddling our thumbs, watching it happen, and uh, we're all going to be uh, killed by that death of a thousand cuts that you're talking about. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for joining us today. We certainly appreciate it. Professor Rob you, Jenkins Mike. from Georgia it. State University. Uh, and we will be right back after these messages. You're listening to Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio. And we're back. You're listening to Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio. And we're joined now by Charles Lamandry, who is from the, uh, I think it's the Los Angeles area that you're located, isn't it, Charles? Uh, I'm in Southern California. I'm in San Diego. Okay. Uh, Lamandry and Jonah is the uh, is the law firm, and we've had uh, both uh, Charles and uh, Paul, I think is Jonah's first name, on several times before, usually in the area of religious liberty or free speech rights. Right. But this is a basically a medical malpractice case, really, when you get down to it. But it has uh, a lot of... Uh, a lot of impact, I think, on a lot of other things that are going on in this country today. So let's talk about this young gal uh, who I guess uh, uh, was surrendered up onto the altar of transgenderism when she was 12. And um, you can take it from there. Sure. We're representing, uh, in this particular case, Kayla Lovedahl, who, as you indicated, was 12 years old when she started down this uh, disastrous path of undergoing what they call euphemistically uh, gender-affirming care. And she did this in Northern California at Kaiser, a facility in Oakland, uh, California. 
And uh, believe it or not, at, uh, shortly thereafter, uh, just after she turned 13, they did a double mastectomy on her. And so uh, now she's permanently uh, mutilated to realize by the time she became 18, she had made a, a tragic mistake. And like so many other uh, young people, it's having to live with these consequences of getting this uh, misguided and, we believe, grossly negligent uh, medical care. And, you know, you're right. It's not part of um, our normal focus, which is uh, religious liberty and uh, pro-life judicial family uh, values and the way it's framed as a medical malpractice case. But obviously it impacts uh, these these values across the board. It's anti-life to be doing uh, to these uh, young people uh, what they're doing. In fact, uh, those reflecting on uh, the scriptural uh, passage where our Lord said, you know, fear not those who can just kill the body like they do in abortion, which right. is, of course, uh, a terrible scourge on the country, but those who can cure, kill the body and the soul. And that's what they're doing with these kids. They're mutilating their bodies and they're, you know, putting their souls uh, in peril uh, by leading them down this path where they could uh, never be, be happy or fulfill God's will for them. One of the things that, that God gave them. Go ahead. One of the things that interested me in the case was that obviously this young girl uh, was uh, had had several problems. She had some mental health right. problems and other problems, but she never really realized that she might be transgender until she read about it online. Right, which indicates to me that the argument that this is really a social contagion and not a medical problem, uh, is more prevalent than maybe the media and uh, the government officials would give it credit for. Absolutely, uh, Mike. And really, there could be no question about it, because uh, historically, this was never uh, an issue that directly concerned uh, teenage girls. It was uh, middle-aged uh, men would uh, seek to go through this transgender process, or sometimes a more rare uh, young boys who per, had pervasive and per, persistent uh, feeling that somehow they, they were really girls. It was uh, never a situation for teenage girls to kind of like spontaneously think that uh, I must really be a, a boy. I and mean, both of our, our clients, Chloe Cole, who's been quite outspoken, and uh, Kayla uh, Lovedahl, who went through uh, Kaiser, coincidentally, uh, same program, same place, around the same time and close to the same ages. Uh, went to what's called the precocious puberty. So like around nine years old, they started to develop uh, breasts and such. And, you know, that's uh, a, a, an age where they were getting a lot of uh, teasing, hazing by, by other students and, and grew to be very uncomfortable with the fact that they were uh, going through puberty, particularly at an early age. And then not untypically, uh, young girls who start their menstrual cycles and, and such find that to be uh, an unpleasant experience that they don't know quite what to deal with. And then you couple that with what's going on with the Internet and all the images they see, and both of them saying how uh, they didn't want to be a woman who would be exploited and abused by men the way they're seen uh, on the Internet. So for the first time in history, they're giving uh, young girls an option. Well, you don't have to do any of that. You can be a man. You know, you, you can I escape all of the travails of uh, uh, puberty puberty that girls have been going through since the beginning of time. And so now you see this onslaught of cases beginning around 2015. Why? Well, a couple of things happened then. Uh, one, the Obergefell decision came out legalizing same-sex marriage, and the whole LGBT juggernaut turned all their attention at that point to the T side <laughs> of mm -hmm. the LGBT thing. They, they accomplished their goals. The same-sex marriage, now transgender, became the focus. They used all their resources to push that. And Bruce Jenner comes out. And, and that's what uh, what uh, Kayla Lovedahl said is that, oh, I first became aware of it when I heard that uh, Bruce Jenner transitioned uh, to a woman. So I got the idea, well, gee, I should be able to you know, transition uh, as well. So we've seen now an increase by thousands of percent, literally, of teenage girls so for the first time in the history of the world uh, saying that uh, we think we should be boys. Uh, that was never an option for girls uh, at such an awkward age. And it was never uh, 
the way science looked at whether or not people could be transgender or not. It was never, like you said, a social contagion or a rapid onset uh, gender dysphoria, uh, which they're calling. And the, the tragedy of it is all the studies show, and there's numerous ones, that if you just leave kids alone that have this gender dysphoria, that the studies show that somewhere between um, 66% and 95%, with the average being about 85% of them, will desist on their own and become comfortable with their um, natural-born gender if you just leave them alone. But they don't do that. Now they're putting them on this conveyor belt of medicalization where they get on the puberty blockers to stunt their growth so they don't go through puberty. And then uh, 98% of those start taking, uh, in the case of girls trying to uh, become transition of boys, um, they start taking cross-sex hormones like testosterone, very powerful drugs. And then, of course, uh, the end result would be either what they euphemistically call top surgery, which is a double mastectomy of otherwise you know, healthy breast tissue, and then uh, even more uh, barbaric is what they call bottom uh, surgery, which has basically a 100% complication uh, rate. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a horrible situation, and it normally takes five to ten years for people to realize they made a mistake. And since this started to happen in 2015, you're now starting to see the detransitioners come forward in increasing numbers. Already it's close to 30 percent are, are detransitioning. In the next two, three years, it'll be 50 percent or more. And the really bad thing is they don't tell these kids and their parents is the suicide rates are so high. It had been the only major study out of Sweden, a 19-fold increase in suicide rates for uh, transgenders who have gone through this process. And then uh, just a brand new uh, study came out this week from uh, Denmark, published in the uh, Journal of American Medical Association. Right. Uh, also showing a very high rate of suicide. Uh, as I looked at the case, and um, it appears that this girl was deeply disturbed as a as a youngster. Right. She had many problems, and her mother was trying to get her uh, treated for these mental health issues that right. it appears that most of these medical people that dealt with her tended to ignore or brush aside. Exactly. And, and that's the biggest problem here, because for whatever reason, the medical associations uh, tend to take the approach, we don't want to be gatekeepers. So in the case of Kaiser, they actually have, and this was released two weeks ago by a whistleblower, a uh, slide presentation that says, we're going to take these kids at whatever age they come in, uh, at whatever point in their transition process, and just accept it and not question it. So they don't deal with any of the reasons that brought them there. There may have been sexual abuse or any number of things, but uh, almost all of them have deep-seated psychological problems, certainly anxiety and depression, but we see a, a very high number of cases where they're in the autism spectrum or have ADHD or personality disorder like bipolar disorder or, or, or something. And the irony of it is, and it's really, again, a tragic irony, decades ago when the first transgender clinic opened in the United States at Johns Hopkins Hospital, uh, the d director who pioneered it, uh, Dr. Paul McHugh, was still alive in his, in his 90s, ended up shutting it down because they realized after they went through all this to treat the gender dysphoria, the people still had all those same underlying problems, and they were still unhappy. So he said, look, he came to the conclusion, he said the problem is not between their legs, it's between their ears. It's yeah. the mental issues that were never treated. And that's what's happening here. They're not treating these kids' problems. So they go through all this process, have the mutilating surgery, uh, permanent problems in terms of growth, because you can't just put puberty on a pause and go through those years and then expect to pick up where you left off. It's too late. For the girls, it changes the facial structure, the more masculinized uh, uh, shoulders, and uh, more narrow pelvis could make it more uh, difficult to, to bear children if they ever choose to, if they can get pregnant at all, yeah. which is a question after taking uh, these drugs. Uh, so 
Uh, it's, it's a terrible situation because they can never go back and recover uh, what they had lost. But you're right. These other problems, uh, they realize, even though they may get, they call a placebo effect from some of the drugs or even uh, the uh, what they call the top surgery, um, because they wanted to get rid of their breasts because their breasts were a focus of unwanted attention, they start to realize with time they still have all these other problems. Yeah. And they're still just as unhappy, if not more so. So it was never the so-called gender dysphoria that was driving the whole thing. That may have been one issue among many, and the others needed to be resolved. And they're not doing that, and that is a real major problem. I thought you described it rather uh, colorfully by indicating that uh, uh, for the doctors, they surrendered their prescription pad to this 12-year-old girl, let her that's call right. the show. In effect, that's that's what they're doing, they're handing over the prescription uh, uh, pad and letting them make decisions as to uh, what drugs are going to take without giving them full informed consent so that they and their parents can make intelligent decisions. In fact, they don't know the long-term effects right. because this has never been done before. These drugs like Lupron, the puberty blockers, they use it to chemically, chemically castrate uh, convicted sex offenders. So they're, they're yeah, very powerful and strong powerful. drugs that have terrible side effects. Now the question, of course, go, ahead. go ahead. I was going to say, the, no. one of the questions I had was the role of, of mom here. Uh, it sounded right. like mom eventually bought into this. And I'm wondering right. if this is what is happening across the board where um, whatever uh, medical background uh, these doctors have, they can kind of uh, wave the, the, you know, the shiny object in front of mom and get her to agree that uh, we've got to do something or this girl's going to commit suicide because that's one of the arguments exactly. they use. Yeah, and, and they're actually trained these uh, doctors to and tell social them workers they use a coercion. Exactly correct. And some of them are have like master degrees; uh, they're not M- MDs or PhDs. Um, they they tell them, "Would you rather have, in the case of my clients, a, a dead daughter or a, a live son?" And they did that with both of these girls. And we're hearing that over and over as the detransitioner starts to come forward that that's a type of coercion. Even though they had no suicidal ideation uh, prior to this, they had other problems. And in the case of Kayla Lovedall, even you know some self harm, cutting and such, but uh, never a suggestion she was going to kill herself. And the same with Chloe Cole. The suicidal ideation came after they got on these uh, powerful drugs. Uh, so uh, they, the parents, have the kids coming to them, saying that you know I think I'm a boy. They take the kids to people they think are professionals and experts who should know what they're doing and trust these people. And these people tell them, well, yes, that is a problem. And uh, if you want your kid to be happy, this is the only course of action and not giving them uh, other courses of action. And, And other countries that have been doing this a lot longer have completely backed off. So in England in France, in Sweden, in, in Finland, and in, in Belgium, you know, typically very liberal countries, they've all stopped doing this gender uh, affirmation. They're not giving these drugs. They're not doing these surgeries. Some countries have backed off the surgeries, or at least put it at uh, you know adult uh, ages, like uh, Australia. Uh, but here in the U.S., it's still pedal to the metal. Now, yeah. 20 states have uh, banned it. Uh, and others are considering doing so severely uh, restricting it. But in uh, the major coastal states, California and New York, it's complete reversal, and they're making them sanctuary states and yeah. saying that you could bring your kids here and or they can come on their own and we'll let them get this gender-affirming care and, and surgery regardless of uh, what the laws are in their home state. So there's going to be litigation over that. But in California, is so bad. Uh, just, I think it was yesterday, the day before, our state Senate voted and they expect the Assembly to do it. And the governor said he'll pass a, a law that if a kid's only 12 years old and they want to change their gender and the parents don't agree, uh, they can go to a counselor or someone at school and they'll contact uh, and the state agencies, child protective services, or whatever, and they'll put them in a group home. They'll take the kid out of the home. At 12 years old, the kid gets to decide. So, talk about a direct assault on the family 
and parental rights. And, and that's what it's coming down to. Yeah. Again, this um, woman who was on uh, Newsmax on, on Monday on the segment before me, I was talking about this case. She was talking about what was going on in the pride parades around the country. And the commentator was asking her, and again, she's a lesbian woman who started a group called Gays Against Grooming. We've had her on. Really all a, We've had her on this program. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, she actually came and said it's all about uh, pedophilia. Right. If they can get these kids to consent to these types of medical treatments and surgeries, they can get them to legally consent to have sex with adults. Mm -hmm. So it's about money. It's driven by the medical and pharmaceutical industries. Yeah, because once you get on these drugs, you can't get off them. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's lifetime. And it's also about pedophilia. It's shocking, you know, and this is an admission by someone who's kind of part of that community. Yeah. Uh, uh, Admitting it. And it's true. We're seeing this now in our cases in the schools. We're fighting how they're sexualizing these kids at the earliest imaginable ages, even preschool. What is Kaiser's so, response thus far? You know, it's their party line is that we give full informed consent to the kids and their parents, and they make the decision, and we give the best uh, quality care in lines with the standard of practice. But I, it doesn't sound account. like they gave uh, got informed consent. They're withholding no, information. Uh, that... Even if you take... The ultra-liberal standards of groups like uh, WPATH, which supposedly has national standards of care, they just made up, and they're all ideologues. Mm -hmm. Even they say you have to go through a proper psychological evaluation. You can't just affirm the kid uh, by their own words, like they did with Luca Loved After 75 minutes, they said, okay, let's start. Uh, No treatment, uh, no proper psychological assessment at all. Same thing with Chloe Cole. And same thing with most of these kids. They said, we're not going to be gatekeepers. What what does that mean? We're not going to be gatekeepers. A kid comes to you terribly disturbed. They're children. You're professionals. And you're just going to take their word for it. But that's the policy. So that's what they call proper care. Hand over the pad. It's really outrageous. Pardon me? Hand over the pad, the prescription pad. Exactly correct. You decide what drugs you want to take. And we'll, we'll give them to you. Okay. And then uh, with the testosterone, they get like a, a high and they feel like indestructible at first, but it, it, it takes their toll on them uh, after a while. Uh, but the, the puberty blockers are in, in, insidious in, in how they operate. They can even retard uh, brain development because everything's working together at the same time, you know, with respect to uh, adolescence. And the irony of it is, uh, these groups, like the American uh, Pediatric Association, uh, had previously come out and said kids should not be able to get tattoos before they're 18 because they lack the maturity to make a decision about you know a potential permanent mark on their body. Right. But yet they come out and say they can have mutilating surgery and have you know either their breasts removed if they're girls or their genitals removed if they're uh, boys. It's, it's just completely insane and irrational. What are we hoping comes out of this case? And the companion case. We're hoping got going. because in states like California and New York, there's no hope of the government, the state governments doing the right thing because they're so uh, driven by ideology. And it has nothing to do with caring for these kids. It's about pushing this agenda forward. Uh, so the only way we're going to get traction is through the courts. And if we could get some uh, good uh, judgments out of the courts, that this is below the standard of care, which we believe we can because they don't need to meet their own crazy standards, uh, then hopefully it will give pause to this, you know, out of control uh, train that's uh, basically injuring so many kids. And the more time goes on, the more evidence is coming forward, like that JAMA study that just came out and the number of detransitioners that are showing up, you know, on almost a daily basis. So uh, we're hoping that it brings attention to this. People become informed. You know, the truth should prevail. It usually does. Uh, And uh, we think with time, this will have to stop. It is just so wrong. It's been compared to like when they were doing the lobotomies. Everybody thought it was, you know, a great thing in the 40s or 50s or whatever. And the the guy who came up with it got a Nobel Prize. And everybody's now aghast looking back at the the tragedy that it it represents. Well, that's the same thing happening here on a grander scale. A couple of huge judgments against them will teach them a lesson, I'm sure. That's right. Uh, You know, uh, that's what it's going to take. 
Now, in states like harder, uh, California, it's harder because they have restrictions on punitive damages and such. In medical right. And you're in cases, state court there, aren't you? We're, this we're case in state court. Right. We also have another case coming up in Nebraska, though, where the laws are more favorable. Okay. And it's a, a very similar uh, situation. So there are going to be more and more of these cases. And uh, we expect that it's going to turn the tide. Good. They're going to have to take notice and they're going to have to stop or there's going to be a huge uh, penalty in the form of these big awards. Well, we appreciate your time. We're just about out of it, by the way. Uh, okay. But we appreciate your time. We're going to pray for you. We, I think Please you're doing do. God's work. Uh, out there. And uh, again, we'll have you back when you get the things going in uh, Nebraska and other places, because this is an important issue that uh, really is wrecking havoc with uh, a lot of children, especially as they're all being exposed in a lot of our public schools to transgenderism right. in this. Yeah, something we've got. And to- we've got a couple of cases dealing with that. We could talk about at some point, uh, Deacon Mike, when, when it's, um, it's the right time for you. Yeah, we'll get you back. We'll get you back. Okay, You've always been good with us before, and we appreciate it. Thank you very much for joining us today. God bless you, uh, and uh, we'll keep you in our prayers. Charles Madre, who is with Madre and Jonah in Southern California, who is suing, is suing uh, the Kaiser Hospital out there. All right, we will be right back after these messages. You're listening to Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio. And we're back. I'm back. Gina's gone. Uh, you're listening to Faith on Trial and Iowa Catholic Radio. Had two interesting guests this morning. Uh, first of all, we talked with the English professor, Rod Jenkins, about the attack against religious liberty on college campuses, which was an eye-opener. And uh, the uh, second guest, Charles Lamandry, uh, we've had on before, but this was uh, today about a malpractice case involving the transgender surgery of a 12-year-old girl who had a double mastectomy at age 13. And I, uh, if you get a chance to, uh, to look up that court case, as a matter of fact, what I would do is I've got a link to it, too long to mention here, but I will put it on our uh, Faith on Trial blog uh, with the promo for the program since it's going to actually air over the weekend uh, so that you can look up that case yourself. Um, before we go, uh, I think... Uh, we want to talk about what is coming up next week. And what is coming up next week is the 4th of July, the birthday of the United States. And I think uh, we have seen a lot of challenges to our not only independence, but our religious beliefs uh, over the years that I think would, uh, would uh, run afoul of what those 56 men that signed the Declaration thought they were doing in 1776. We've seen attacks on our religious institutions. We've seen attacks on our religious uh, programs. Uh, We've seen uh, demands uh, made on churches that are silly and stupid in order to control them. Uh, We've seen a lot of things that have been going on recently in the past. And if you've been a faithful listener to this program, you've heard about many of them. Um, We need to go back to what it was that we were founded upon, and that's independence and freedom, especially those First Amendment freedoms of religion, speech, and uh, and assembly, which were being, in many respects, uh, we're seeing curbed these days. Uh, So we want to let you know that uh, this week coming up, uh, we ought to refocus ourselves on those issues and those ideas and those topics that we dealt with in 1776 and realize that the country has come a long way since then, and it's a country that needs to be recognized for what it has done and what has tried to do, and not as some would have it, as being recognized by only its faults. So we ask you to take this into consideration, to uh, tune into our programs, Share the messages you get from these programs with others, uh, especially other patriots. And we wish you all a very happy 4th of July. Let's end now with our Defender's Prayer. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin 
of souls. Amen. Again, thank you for listening. Until next time, have a blessed and very patriotic week. Our freedom of conscience and religion is being challenged by laws and regulations imposed by secular society. Faith on Trial with Defender of the Faith, Deacon Mike Mano. Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio, iowacatholicradio.com, and the Iowa Catholic Radio app.